Setting up a, a field school on this site was in fact only a, a natural step. Uh, it was a formalizing of an existing situation. Uh, for many years, a great number of, of the excavators that work with Mark are Egyptian. His site director is Egyptian, uh, some of the best excavators are Egyptian, and in the recent years, when I first started working here, we had six, eight people training, coming down from the Giza Taftish and working side by side with the foreign archaeologists. It seemed absolutely logic to formalize this and use this setting as, as a field school. It's a very good setting because there are many specialists that can talk about the different types of material that we have. And it's also a settlement site. And settlement archaeology is very difficult. Um, clearing and recording a tomb, clearing and recording a temple is one thing. But mud brick architecture in this kind of conditions, wet, close to the town, in an urban setting, it's difficult uh, archaeology. And in a sense, it's the type of archaeology that is difficult to learn unless you have the opportunity. So this seemed a good setting. The, the conditions are s controlled, and yet they are sufficiently difficult that it's not just an exercise. One of the things that has always made me or made us feel uncomfortable is when field schools are run as an exercise. A little square is opened, the students do a little bit of archaeology, but then it's closed again. Here it's very serious in the sense that any excavation is destroying what is being excavated. So the students, just like us, are destroying, they are excavating the same archaeology. So it has to be uh, taken very seriously and recorded very seriously. These are challenging conditions to run a field school, but they are very good conditions as well. And it's been a really great opportunity that we have now run three field schools um, in a cycle of two years. So a beginner's field school where we cover the very basics of archaeological recording according to what we now see as an emerging practice in archaeology. The same way that surveyors or dentists or doctors have got codes of practice. You don't do just any old thing, you're supposed to do certain things. Archaeology is the same. There are, you, there, there's variety, but you are supposed to do a minimum. And this minimum is what we would like to teach. Not because we know it any better than anybody else, but because we have been doing this for many years. And in a sense, we take pride in, in, in excavating like this. And it seemed such a good opportunity to explain and, and give a chance to colleagues who work side by side to formally give them a chance to learn with a proper setting, with lectures, with a sequence of, of, of skills that they have to learn, with manuals, with all the material that they need to then go out and do the work that, that needs to be done in Egypt. Okay, now you go back here and you look at it from the side. The students of the field school are colleagues. In fact, they are not only our peers, but administratively, they are our superiors. They supervise our work. Every mission in Egypt has an inspector that supervises the work. Now, it's almost impossible to supervise work that you don't understand. And this is very unfair. Uh, Egyptian universities are wonderful at language and history. Uh, Egyptian archaeologists, they are really good at reading hieroglyphs and they are very good at history and they are very good at many skills. But they haven't had the chance to learn archaeological practice. And yet, they go out into the field and they are expected to run excavations and to supervise excavations. And so this process sets uh, up, I think by Dr. Hawass, of training um, Egyptian archaeologists in the practice, the standard practice of archaeological recording, means that they can now do the job that they are supposed to do, which is to check that the work is being done correctly, because foreigners, like anybody else, 
have different objectives and perhaps the work is not quite up to standard. We have the same thing back in Europe, in France, in, in England. There is a body that checks that archaeological work is done according to the standards and is not pushed by money, for instance, or by other, other motives. Um, and so they are our colleagues. They have a very strong background on Egyptian history, Egyptian art, uh, religion, language, but they haven't had much practice in terms of drawing, survey, excavation, photography. And the idea for us is to cover all these basic techniques at a low-tech level, because a lot of people rely on technology to cover for the deficiencies, let's say, of knowledge. And, and this is obviously a mistake. You can do very good archaeological work with the simplest of tools, with a tape, with a compass, with millimeter paper, notebook and pencil, and, and some knowledge, some know-how. And this is the basic principle of the first year of the field school, is that you should be able to do a lot of good work with very simple tools. The second year is for specializing. And this, again, we're quite happy with, we're quite proud of. We uh, had, I think, four specializations. We had human osteology, which is burial excavation. And uh, then we had ceramics. Archaeological illustration, which includes epigraphy, archaeological survey, and also some people specializing further on excavation, which in itself takes time to learn. So we were very happy with that because we saw colleagues that for many years have been studying, say, mummies or skeletons and really need a, a specializing type of knowledge, an opportunity to work in this type of conditions. And here we were able to do it. At least for one year we've run this advanced field school. Uh, so that in the end, when you have a lot of Egyptian sites being excavated and a lot of material coming out of those sites, the material just doesn't just pile up in some storeroom. So that there are Egyptian ceramicists and illustrators and surveyors and osteologists that can process the material and bring it together, just like we do on, on this excavation. We have only run field schools for Egyptian antiquities inspectors. We've had some interest from uh, foreigners who would like to have a field school as part of their coursework. And we have had some interest. Uh, from, we were also approached by um, Egyptian um, uh, students from the Cairo University. But we feel, at, at least at the moment, that the, the crying need is for those who are already in the field and have to tackle archaeological situations on a day-to-day -day basis. So at the moment, our field school is exclusive to SCA, Egyptian Antiquities Inspectors. Um, at the same time, it's true that we do train other people because if people join us and they have a little bit of experience in Europe, but they don't have much experience, we are automatically training them. So we have more people training than actually show as field school students. We always have a certain number of people coming from the Giza Taftish down to work side by side. Some as, as colleagues, they, they know the full range of the work, others as beginners. Um, those we don't say they are field school students because they're not, but they are training. So in a way, training is, is continuous and across the board. But as far as the field school is concerned, it's at the moment exclusive to inspectors that have to work every day for the SCA.